Welcome to the online broadcast ministry of Crossroads Church. Pastor Boone has another real-time message designed with you in mind. So grab a pen and download our online worship map and let God's word encourage your heart. Prepare to be blessed. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Give the Lord some praise in this house today. Oh, that's okay. He's worthy, worthy, worthy. The little bitty say, not just blessed, but truly, truly blessed. Amen. Welcome to the house of the Lord today. We're beginning a new teaching series. We're calling it Experiencing God's Favor. And uh, today's message is a little bit on the interesting side, you know. Sometimes you gotta, you gotta eat broccoli, amen. I don't do, what is it, Brussels sprouts? I'm not even sure why God made those. And, but he's omnipotent like that, so I'm sure there's somebody that likes them, but um, sometimes messages are sweet like candy and sometimes they're like Brussels sprouts, but it's all good eating if it's, if it's from God, say amen. Welcome to Crossroads Church. We're going to start this series. We're calling it Experiencing God's Favor. And so I got to tell you that, uh, quite honestly, you can't be stingy. Our message is entitled, You Can't Be Stingy and Blessed at the Same Time. It is virtually impossible to be both stingy and blessed at the same time. It's virtually impossible to be stingy and blessed at the same time. I brought with me a few buzzwords that are normally associated by way of introduction with folks who are considered stingy folks. One of my oldest sons, I would say that he was stingy. He says, no, no, Pops. They call me Pops, which I'm not sure I like or don't like yet, but Pops. I'm like, that sounds like old, and I'm still very, 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 very much young and good looking. Amen. Amongst other things. That's all right. You don't have to love you. Amen. But and he said, my wife said, you're good. That's right, baby. I'm sorry, that's first lady, baby. I'm sorry, I can't say that at church. He says, I'm not stingy. I'm frugal. I said, that's another word for that is cheap. I brought some words which kind of sort of bear that in mind. When, when you're thought of as being a stingy person, here's some words, of negative connotation, selfish, cheap. Look at this, it gets kind of ugly. Petty, miserly, a tightwad, a penny pincher, someone who's uncharitable, but my favorite on the list, I think really helps it, helps sell it, is someone who's closed fisted. Now, you and I both know that it's impossible to put something into a closed fist. It's virtually impossible to squeeze anything. Whatever's in there is stuck in there, and whatever is supposed to be in there in abundance can't happen because the fist is closed. On the other side of the coin, there are words that are the opposite, if you would, of these that I just gave you referring to someone who's stingy. They are. You want to be thought of as a person who is altruistic, someone who's selfless, someone who's unselfish, someone who is benevolent, someone who is good-hearted, great-hearted, and open-hearted, but my favorite on this list, as opposite to being closed, um, closed-fisted, you want to be thought of someone who is free. Amen. Free to trust God and free to obey God and free to expect good things from God. You want to be thought of not as a stingy person, but someone who is free. It is impossible to be closed-fisted and free at the same time. For some, for some of us, quite honestly, though I hate to say it, Christians all around the world, and particularly in the United States of America, we've chosen the first list. How do I know that? It's been a standing fact, and of course numbers are subjective, but it's been stated that less than 3%, say that with me, 3%. It's been stated that 3% of those of us who name the name of Christ actually release a tithe to the, to the Lord. That would be 10%. 
3% of those who shout and dance and sing and lay hands on folks and do all kinds of wonderful deeds and charitable deeds. And, but when it comes to giving unto the Lord out of a trust attitude or to sponsor the work of the Lord, most of us fall into that first category where we're frugal or we're cheap. 3% of all Christians in the United States. Now, that's a problem for us this morning. Why? Because it's impossible to be stingy and blessed at the same time. And so I want all that God has for me. If, I'm about, if, if, if anyone's with me, say amen heartily. Amen. I need all of my favor. I, I need all of whatever God's got with my name on it. I don't want you to have. Can I be that way this morning? I don't want you to have what I'm supposed to have. Amen. I want all that God has for me, but we often block it. I'm going to suggest to you two short weeks we're going to talk about this. We often block God being able to give us more because we won't release that he's already given us. Stand in honor of God's word. You should see a passage of scripture, Matthew. I believe it is chapter 6, verse 24 at the top of your worship map. If it's there, say amen. Let's jump in. You can't be stingy and blessed at the same time. If you can't stand on your feet, stand in your heart. The word of God to the people of God, Matthew 6. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and, uh, what's the Bible say here? Love the other. You will be devoted to one and you will despise the other. And he narrows it down. You cannot serve both God and money. You may be seated. I mentioned earlier that word is a word, that love is a word, excuse me, that it should be reserved for an exclusive uh, group of people. For example, I am in love with the woman that God gave me as my wife. And uh, amen. I say that publicly. I also say it privately. I was watching her this morning and I was thinking, man, I love me some first lady. Amen. That's okay. Y'all don't have to get that. I, I <laughs> I, you, well, you should look at your spouse and your husband and say, man, I love, I don't like them, but I love me some, whatever their name is. See, love is an exclusive word. You can't apply that to everyone. There are a lot of folks I like, and, I, and, I, and I'll be honest with you, some of us don't like nobody, but amen. But, but for those of us who get beyond ourselves, there are a group of people that we like, and there are some folks that we love. The Lord said in this particular text, that there is a relationship, and I hate to go here with you, but I got to teach you this. There is a, la- a relationship uh, 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 principle in play as it relates to uh, the, the nature of the relationship. You're going to be in love with something, and you're going to despise something else. There's no such thing as being able to share love, genuine love, in two places. It's reserved. He said in a text, you're going to either be in love with me, or you're going to be in love with the money that comes from me. And so then you and I are faced with a question this morning. If we're going to experience God's favor, we have to come to the conclusion that we can't be stingy and be blessed at the same time. I want to give you some insight as to how to move beyond this this attitude. You can triumph over what I would like to call the trap of stinginess and experience the full measure of God's favor by doing a couple of things. And what on first on our list this morning, you can you can release God's full favor. Watch this. You want to write this down in your worship map. There's a spot for it. By demonstrating a heart of generosity towards God. By demonstrating a heart of generosity towards God. One of the things that's confusing for us that gets in the way of us being able to release uh, God to fu- to fully to God is, our, is, the, is the block, the blockage that says, well, I'm not giving to a church or I'm not giving to a minister. And, and I, I, well, I had that block in my mindset. I'm thinking I need to make sure that I'm a better steward and just handing it over. But I realized something later on in my walk with Christ that maturity teaches me that I'm releasing it to God. And so then I need to position myself in a, in a place where I can trust that the people of God and the ministers of God are working for God so that I can be a good steward and have a heart of generosity, not toward programs, not toward the mission fund, not toward putting up new lights in the sanctuary, but toward God, a heart of generosity toward God. Take your Bible to the, to the, to the book of Proverbs. You're going to keep them out, and if you've got your electronic version, Keep them out today. You're going to be, uh, they're going to get a lot of work. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible this morning. 
we're talking about generating one of the ways you overcome this whole this whole tightness and become more free closed fisted and become more free is by demonstrating the heart of generosity towards God. Proverbs chapter 11, 24. There is one who scatters yet increases all the more. There is one who withholds what is justly due and yet it results only in want. The generous man will be prosperous and he who waters will himself be watered. Notice this well-worn uh, concept, this principle that we know as soaping, uh, sowing and reaping in this particular text. It, sowing and reaping is a simple principle. It literally means you cannot harvest what you have not yet planted. It would be kind of odd for a farmer to go out into the fields during the harvest time after not, lay, not having planted one seed to stand there at the dirt thing and asking the question, why isn't anything growing? He would quickly be out of business because he didn't understand the principle. Now, let me help you out. Let me, let me, let me bring it to a modern, a modern day illustration. It's foolishness to go up to the ATM and put your pen in unless you've first done what? Deposited something. Now, it's easy to put somebody else's pen in, but that's another message. You cannot tell me that, you, that you're going to have an expectation to go up into the bank and you know you had the bank account been, been, been dormant for years and you're going to pull out the card and expect something to come out. Here's the law of sowing and reaping. And I want you to understand something. We're not one of those places that every week you talk about money. We cover the whole counsel of God. And when God says stop on this particular subject, I got to stop on this particular subject. Amen, somebody. This is one of those places where you have to understand something. My releasing to God is a great indicator of my generosity, a generous heart toward God. Look at the concept here. He uses, the Proverbs writer, the word scatter. It's an agricultural term, and it's implying the scattering of the seed. I want you to use your sanctified imagination, as my pastor used to always say, and, 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 and go here with me. I have in my hand a bunch of very, very tiny, very, very tiny seeds, and they're in the palm of my hand. I've prepared two fields to receive the seed. I've got this one already torn up and ready to receive a seed, and I've got a field over here. And see, so here's what some of us are settling for, and we can't get God's whole, uh, the release of all of God's favor because we're settling. We'll take a seed. Come, somebody say a seed. We'll take a seed or a seed, depending upon where you're from in the country, amen, and you will go ahead and drop that seed in there and you cover it up and you're thinking, whoo, my work here is done. And there's, there are those, those, of us, those of us who understand the principle of sowing and reaping and whatever God's granted to us, we take those seeds and we do this. And they fall all over. I mean, some close, some far, some, you get the idea, some on top, two in the hole, one in the hole. Amen. Let me ask you to do a little bit of simple math here. Just saying, which of the two fields is more likely to reap a, a greater harvest, the one on your left or the one on your right? You tell me. The one on your right. Why? Because the farmer had enough sense to recognize something. If I release these few seeds in my hand, they're going to watch this, hit the ground, and they're going to produce more seed for me later on. Versus, I got this one seed and I'm praying that nothing happens to it because if it dies, then that's it. Let me help you, to, let me bring it a little closer to you. We've had a really strong economic upturn. Praise God for that. Somebody say amen. But there was a time when many people were out of work and some still are. It would be kind of foolish, wouldn't it, to fill out one application and go home and say, Whoo, praise God, I, ah, my work here is done. I received that job in the name. Let me tell you what you ought to receive. Some more applications. Amen. I'm, that's okay. I'm talking to me. You need to fill out applications everywhere. Somebody say amen. amen. Because you want to grant yourself a greater opportunity to get hired. The principle is pretty, pretty simple. I know it's not real complicated, but watch this. You have to have a heart of demonstrating a heart of generosity to God. Here in Proverbs, the writer, he tells us basically 
The seed is what's scattered and the greater potential. Come on. There is greater potential for the seed you scatter than there is potential for the seed in your hand. The more seed you scatter, the greater likelihood you're going to have an increase. Now, a generous heart is more blessed than a stingy heart for one reason. You ready? It understands who governs the process of sowing and reaping. Take your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We're talking about understanding how foolish it really is to get to take God's blessings upon you. And the, and my, and the youth ministry, just, I just told Nancy at the end of the youth skit, I need that box. <laughs> it's, the, it's, it's incredible. God has a blessing box that's filled with things. I wish you could see this. It's filled with stuff. Come on now, and there ain't any more room for this to fill. Oh, you better go with me here. So what do I got to do? Come on, man. I got, I got, oh, that's the candy. Wait. (laughs) Now, some would say this box is empty now. I would say this box is ready now. Oh, that's okay. You get that yet? Some of us are busy walking around. I, I got to keep, I got to hold on to my box because God going, I, you know, that's, I won't get another box. You know, ooh, it's a tough year this year. You know, everything I need to, oh, gosh, it's a, I'm going to hold on to my box and I'm going to sit it right here. My blessing box. You know, that's my blessing. I'm, ble- I'm blessed, y'all. I'm blessed. And there is a warehouse full of boxes. I wish you'd get this illustration. I'm taking too long to help you to see it. You have to be willing to empty out this box before he can put anything else in it. Somebody say amen. amen. Second Corinthians, I want to show you something. I'm going to put the stuff back in here because I'm going to, I think we're going to use that again. What happened to my nail? Can I have that back, brother? They blessed me so very much this morning. I'm going to hold on to this. This will come in handy here directly. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Are you there? Say amen. Watch this. Now this I say. Don't miss this. He who sows sparingly, come on, talk to me, does what? Reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully also does what? And this is the beauty, verse 7, of New Testament giving. Each one must do as he has purposed in his or her heart, not grudgingly, not under compulsion because God loves what kind of a giver? See, this isn't this. You, you're not going to like it, but giving is a heart issue, not a financial one. And some of us are closed down. Come on. That's OK. I'm still going to keep hammering at the hammering at the door. When your heart is generous toward God, you know something about him. He has a blessing box with your name on it. And all he's trying to do is release it to you. But I get it. People have misused the principles over the years. And folks have taken and bought Learjets and all kinds of foolishness. But I'm talking about your, I'm talking about granting to God what is due his so that he can continue the work where you are sitting. Come on, the landscape of your life has changed drastically. This is my opinion. Since you've been a part of Crossroads Church, if anybody believes that, say amen. Things look better than they used to. You have more clarity. Even when things go wrong, you feel, come on, am I by myself? God has moved. I know for a fact God has restored marriages and healed folks, and he has brought relationships back together, and he's moved away relationships that weren't good for you. I know he's done this. So then your heart of generosity shouldn't be the place, it shouldn't be an issue. It should be whether or not you truly think God is trustworthy or not. It's tough, but it's fair. Again, don't forget to whom our generous heart must be pointed. Paul t- tells us it's God. We got we to gotta be clear here, though. Whenever you withhold your tithe, you're not shortchanging other folks. On the contrary, you're shortchanging yourself. I told the story of Bible study, and it's absolutely true, and I'm not just saying God's a piggy bank, but I'm telling you what's absolutely true. Here since January 1, we're not even out of January yet, and my family and I have believed in being generous to the, toward the heart of God and releasing a tithe to him for a long time. And the latest escapade in the harvest of me scattering seed is we got a check. I, I told him this morning it was for 17000 $1,766.88. $1, 
See, all of that's okay. That's all right. I can tell you to the penny how much it was. And then right after that check came, we received a bonus for $1,500. You don't hear me yet. That may not mean a lot of money at your house, but we, were, we heard Kevin go boom, 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 boom. That was money we hadn't counted on. Somebody say amen. Was, it's gone now, but it was. <laughs> Come on, you, do you know the principle if you, it comes to you and it. But get this, I think that that, represent, that money doesn't represent the little, little fear seed that I planted. It came out of me being willing to say whatever we got. And that's just one of the things that the Lord has done. And this January, I'm thinking, it's going to be a good year. Amen, Psalm 1, verse 10. You're, not, you're hurting your own self. Now, he, God, who supplies seed, I'm sorry, God is the one who supplies seed to the sower, and he also supplies bread for food, will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Verse 11, you will be enriched in how many things? In everything with all liberality. This is good. Don't miss this. When God, God will, come on, God has an expectation that when he blesses you, you're going to turn around and, yeah, your needs will be met, but you'll turn around and look for somebody else to see who, somebody else who needs to be blessed. This is what God wants from us, not just to give you more stuff. We've been, we, we've, been, we've been duped to believe a lie that God's a lotto machine. Put 10 on it, get 100, and then you, and you, and then you and do whatever you want to do. God said, I am trying to use you. I'm trying to bless you to bless somebody else here and again. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing, watch this, thanksgiving to God. It is God, he's the one who produces the seed. He's the one who scatters the seed. He's the one who multiplies the seed. God is the one who produces the crop once the seed is released. And then watch this, the seed that's planted this year is so bountiful that it creates the seed that you'll need to plant next year. I, I hope you understand this. Whenever you release seed, the seed that hits the ground is going to, we're so afraid that the box is not going to be, that the box is going to be empty that we won't release anything. I'm telling you, you can't have nothing until you let something go. Whenever we decide, and I want to be honest with you, oh goodness gracious, there's some weeks when we write that check in, I'm thinking, I'll go home and say, did you tie today? <laughs> and it wasn't a spiritual question, I'm just going to be, hey, amen, did we get this week? No, oh, that's okay, I'm by myself, y'all don't have that kind of problem. And she'll say, yep, and I'll go, my God. <laughs> Who, but it changes my week. Oh, that's okay. You get that. You go past some stuff that you would have stopped at if you thought you had a little money. Oh, it's all, it's all right, yeah. I'm trying to teach somebody. I don't know who it is. You do better with the 90% than you ever do with the 100%. You don't have to tie I said it earlier, I'll say it again. You will tithe in tires if you don't tithe at the church. Amen. Some, something's going to go flat. You're going to hear this when you pull out of the driveway. What in the world is going on with my car? <laughs> Who am I talking to? How many washing machines broke because you decided to? I'm just... Just in case. <laughs> La, you know it's been a rough week. You keep on. He's going to remind you one way or another to trust him completely. The Apostle Paul said, I want to say this, giving is not so much an issue of finances or, or money. And I'll show you why a little bit later here. Paul said it may be a, 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 an issue that you got to deal with because you don't have a generous heart toward God. Secondly, this morning, how is it then that I overcome this whole uh, trap of stinginess? And release the full measure of God's uh, favor on my life in this area. You do so ready by adopting a mindset that views God as, watch this, infinitely more than enough. I want to share with you three mindsets. I need you to find the book of Haggai 
chapter 1. Now, this is one of those New Old Testament passages of scriptures that you probably don't go through on a devotional. So I would suggest if you brought your paper, by, your, 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 your paper printed version, you open up to the index of your Bible and look for the words Haggai. And you'll see in my Bible, it says that that particular book of the Bible is on page number 805. Do what you got to do. Make your way to the book of Haggai. I ain't no shame in the game. I used to put tabs on my Bible on it when I as a new Christian. And whenever pastor said, find Zephaniah, I was like, gotcha. <laughs> ain't no shame in the game. Get to it any way you need to get to it. The book of Haggai, what are we after here? You and I have to adopt a mindset in order to release God's complete favor on our life. You have to come to the conclusion that he is infinitely more than enough for you. Most of us, I remember back in the day when it, was a, when it was a fear issue for me, I had this whole concept, I'm not sure I'm going to have enough. When you, I'll show you what that looks like. That's the first mindset, and I call it the bag mindset, B-A-G. The bag mindset says, I'm only going to have a little bit. I'll never have more than enough. Haggai chapter 1 verse 4 says it this way. The Lord says, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in paneled houses while this house lies desolate? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Verse six, he says, you have so much, but you harvest a little. You eat, but there is not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there is not enough. The New American Standard Version says there's not enough to, to become drunk. Now, let me pause right there. I didn't, Pastor Boone did not give you permission. To go home and say, the Bible said I'll drink, but I didn't drink enough to get drunk. I need to fix that. That's not what I said. He's saying that you only have a little bit. Watch this. You put on clothing, but what does your Bible say? But no, but no one is warm enough. You ought to get this. Who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with what? Holes in it. Don't get this. Watch this. Don't miss this. This is incredible. How, how many of you resemble this particular verse? Not giving to the Lord, he says, consider your ways. Not giving to the Lord is like filling up a bucket, with, uh, trying to fill up a bucket with two or three holes in it. You can pour all the water you want into it, but it's going to be a waste of time. How many, how many of us have earned our paycheck? Am I talking to myself? Only to be broke after we can leave the bank. Oh, that's okay. I'm talking to me. How many of you wait two weeks for your check coming in when the day it hits, you already don't have enough? Oh, I'm talking to me. We, how many of us, we, we got clothes, but we don't have enough clothes. We got a car, but we want a better car. We got a TV, but that's too small. I'm eating, but boy, I wish I had some of that other food that we had last time. We get to the place where we think we, we, we're never satisfied with what God is currently. I, I've had children with a mouthful of breakfast chewing and can hardly talk and say, what's for lunch? What's for lunch? You can't, you got a whole plate. And amen, adult children. Hey, we, God's blessing us and we're busy. This, is not, this isn't enough. But God says, I'll tell you why you never satisfied is because you haven't yet viewed me as enough. That's why you always think you never have enough. Mm. Notice the thing. The more you have seems like the less you have. Here it is. When God's house become second to your house it's like pouring water into a bucket with holes in it with an expectation of walking away with a bucket full of water that's that bag mentality that'll give you another one number two the basket mindset the basket mindset take your bible to deuteronomy chapter 28 when you have the bag mindset you're concerned that you'll never have enough and god said you're right but until you trust me you will never have enough it is un doggone believable how clear that is to me on the other side of the decision we made in my household. Early on, I'm thinking, I remember Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 2. I remember saying to my significant, lovely wife, you know, I will, I, I, we got to eat. We, we can't eat. <laughs> we got to eat. Am I talking to myself? We, we got bills to pay. You're talking about giving 10%. Have you, do you know how much that really is? And I'd never forget, I tell you this every time we talk about it, she said, well, how much is enough? How much will you trust God with? I said, now you got jokes. Now you ask, now you said I don't trust God. 
No, I didn't say you didn't trust God. I said, how much is it? You, you, anybody with me yet? And I gave her a number, being smart. <laughs> we trust God for $50. <laughs> really? She said, okay. I expected an argument. I knew she was going to say. And slowly but surely, in spite of me, God blessed us. I don't think you get this. I, I didn't, I, who, any government workers? I, I, I got a five, seven, nine. I, come on, I didn't go, I skipped six and, and eight. And, <laughs> they don't get me yet. And then I went from a nine, I got promoted to, uh, to the 11. Folks were saying, what's wrong with you? And my wife said, let me show you what we're giving now. It was way past $50, amen. But the more God blessed us, she trusted him. I, I'm going to be honest. I, I'm just going to tell the truth, shame the devil. She kept trusting him. He kept blessing us. She kept trusting him. He kept blessing us. She kept trusting him. He kept blasting us. She kept trusting him. He kept blessing us. We walked away. Why am I doing this? From a job I was making about $85,000 a year. Somebody said, I heard somebody say, mm, that's what I said. I said, God, you want me to do what? He said, you heard me. I said, but I, I, I got to retire. I got stuff to do. He said, nope, do this and do it now. And my salary, the day I became the pastor of Crossroads Church, was cut in half the day I left my other job. Did I tell you there's a blessing box with you? He said, I got to empty out the box first, boom. Before, oh, you ain't with me yet. I got See, if it's too much in that box, you ain't going to trust me. Oh, that's okay. I need to take all this stuff out of the box so that you'll know that I am who I say I am. And I can do what I say I can do. And I'll grant you whatever I deserve you think you deserve. And no matter what happens, no matter what your job, no matter who writes your check, I'm still God. And I said, A. Man, still ain't making more and more than 45, but God's good. That's okay. When you have a basket mindset, you understand Deuteronomy 28 and 2 that God is more than enough. Verse 2. You will experience, you got to say this word with me. It starts with B and it has two S's in it and it ends with an S. So you see it, what is it? Blessing. When you see it, say it. You will experience all these. If you obey the Lord your God, your towns and your fields will be. Your children and your crops will be. The offsprings of your herds and your flocks will be. Your fruit baskets and your bread baskets will be. Wherever you go and come on somebody, whatever you do will be. The Lord will conquer your enemies for you. When they attack you, they'll attack you from one direction. But God is so good at, at, at getting folk out of your way. He's going to scatter them, he said, in seven directions. Do you see it? The means through which you and I are guaranteed the experience of God's favor. Did you miss it? You got, you got, constant, you got focused on blessed. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed. Look at what... Activates the blessing. You ready? Verse 2. You will experience all these blessings. There it is if you do what? Obey. See, God wants to, I believe he wants to release the full measure of his blessings on your life, but you got to be obedient. You know the difference between obedient and disobedient. If you got children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews, I don't have to explain this to you. What part about take out the garbage did you not understand? I don't, mean t I don't mean this is good. I don't mean take the garbage out, tie it up, sit it on the side, put a new bag in and walk away. I took it out. No, you took it out of the garbage can. Let me be specific. Take it out the garbage can. Come on, somebody. Tie it up. Carry it to the front door. Put it down. Open the front door. I'm talking to me, I'm talking to my boys now. Come on, somebody. Pick it up, close the front door, because you're the one born in the barn. Amen. That's okay, y'all don't get me. <laughs> Walk over to the trash can. Yes, there are ants and stuff on it. That's all right. You should have took your gloves too late. Lift it up, toss it in, close it down. Come back in the house, wash your hands. Obedience means not only do you hear me, but you do what you heard me to tell you to do. Oh, that's good. 
See, he said, I need you to bring to me the tithe. He said, bring it back to me. When you have a mindset that is the basket mindset, you know God is good enough, uh, more than enough, and you'll give him whatever, he, you'll obey him. But there's even one more level, I believe, amen, of obedience. And that I like to call it the barn mindset. Look at verse 28. When you have this mindset, you know that God is infinitely more. Not is he more than enough, he is infinitely more than enough. The Lord, verse 8, will command, oh, this is good for me, the blessings upon you and your barns and all, and, and all that you put your hand to, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Now, I know some of you are saying, well, he's talking to Israel, but I'll tell you something about my God. There's always a principle that could be gleaned. I would, if we started, if we started, um, if we started looking at scripture, you have to start with the context it's written in, but there's always an application to be had for you, otherwise he wouldn't have written it to us in the first place. Look at what he says he'll do regarding the, the, how the blessings are coming upon you. He says, I will command this. The word command here means I'm going to lay a charge upon. He literally says, hear the words, I will instruct your blessing to fall upon you. I will decree that a blessing fall upon you. I will give charge to a blessing to fall upon you. I will ordain a blessing to fall upon you. I will assign a blessing to fall upon you. There was a check. For $1,766.88, and that, that particular amount of money was told, listen, I know where you're sitting now, but I want you to make your travel through the electronic, come on somebody, ways of the banking system, and I want you to land and pass the Boone's account. And I, I, and I didn't do anything. All I did was just throw the seed up and turn and went on about my business. And meanwhile, the seed was, come on somebody, and that wasn't enough. We were celebrating that one, and another one came for 1,000. You don't get me yet. God said, leave where you are. Do you get it? When you obey God, he'll say, leave where you are, blessing, and go to where they are. Here's the question on my table for you. How many blessings are stacked up in holding, waiting on you to do what you're supposed to do? We've been over here months, and he just, that blessing just showed up, and he gone. What kind of folks do we have? I don't even want to release the blessing. You walking around with seeds in your pocket. Oh, that's all right. And if, <laughs> and if one of them happened to fall out, you'll search high. Oh, Lord, I lost the I lost the seed in your, put it what? Let me tell you something. The life of a seed, it was never meant to be left in your purse at the bottom of your purse. You know what it said? It'll stay in your purse as a th for a thousand years as one seed. <laughs> but if you plant it, let me, uh, you get this, this is not new, but I'm going to slow this down so you get it. You can count, you ready? You can count the number of seeds in an apple. But you can't count the number of apples in a seed. Oh, it's okay. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. One seed has so much potential. You never know what God's going to do when you release that one seed. And you're busy saying, I got 10 seeds and holding on to them. No, just release them and let God multiply them even more. I love Deuteronomy. He says, I'm going to command the blessings to follow you around. Finally, this morning... If you're going to move beyond this whole concept of being closed fisted or the, or the burden of stinginess, the trap of stinginess, and if you want to experience the full measure of God, you can do so, ready, by proving yourself trustworthy enough to affirm his favor. Proving yourself trustworthy enough to affirm his favor. I hate to dump on my family so very much, but they are such good sermon illustrations. I have two teenage, I had, they're grown men now, two teenage boys. At, at 16, I released my car keys to one of my children and said, see you later, sir. God bless you. What time are you coming home? I had another one that said, I'm 16. And I was like, no way, Jose. <laughs> you are not getting my key. Well, at, here we go. At 16, you allowed him to get the keys? That's not fair. And I said, favor ain't fair. Come on, you know what it's based off of many times? Trustworthiness. 
This is a boy who I said, quit flying down the hill on the bike. You're going to kill yourself. And he waits wait till I'm looking out the window. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's all right. I see you. Watch out for cars. <laughs> okay. And so when he said, I'm 16, do I get the keys? No way, Jose. Why? I said, because you haven't proven yourself to be trustworthy in the small things that I've asked you to do. And you want me to release a two-ton vehicle in your crazy possession? No, sir. How about you? What are you standing in desperate need of for God to release into your life? Oh, it's okay. I'm getting in now. But you're saying, well, you bless somebody else. He said, yeah, but they have proven themselves to be. Can I give it to you another way? Another way? It's not always so much, as, watch this, as, as, as him saying whether or not you are trustworthy, but is he worthy of your trust? Watch this. Go to Luke chapter 16. Take your Bible there. My son said, do you tell everything about us? I said, as much as I can remember. <laughs> Later on, I said, here's what I'm going to need from you. I'm going to need you to show me, demonstrate some trust. This is my same child. I'm going to tell it, amen. Luke chapter 16, who we helped him to go to the credit union, Mary, and get a Mazda 626. Brand new, Mazda 626. We were so proud. It's a nice, safe car. Mm, maybe a month, maybe two months later, he drives up in a Camaro. I, I traded that in. Say, really? <laughs> <laughs> what was the rates? Were they a little higher? I bet they were a little higher. Some folk, man, I don't know, man. I, I, I was, secretly, I was thinking, dog, I wish I hadn't. I wish I could have did that when I was his age. But his mom was standing there saying, boy! He trade. I, I was like, "Who car you stole?" That's, <laughs> that's my car. I said, "What happened to the Mazda?" Oh, I traded that in. So, wow, boy, you you. I'm gonna have to pray for you more than I ever. Luke 16 verse 10. You ready? I'm reading from the NIV this time, and it says, "Whoever can be your Bible may say faithful." The NIV says, "Whoever can be trusted with a little can also be trusted with much." And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be what? Dishonest with much. So that if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Here, and I'm almost done. The, here the Lord makes the connection between spiritual stewardship and material stewardship. He calls into question the res our resourcefulness as managers or stewards over the wealth that he's loaned us. I, this is an amazing thought. Over your lifetime, the Lord has designated a certain amount of wealth to be loaned to you. And he's watching to see, come on, whether, for, whether it's $1,000 or whether it's $100,000, he's designated this amount of, of, amount of um, um, finances to you and as a steward. And he's watching to see how you handle whatever it is he's trusted you with. Watch this. He literally asked the questions, can I trust you with, with money? Or are you going to stuff your purse, add another heavy duty strap to it so you, because it's getting so heavy you can't hold it? Or are you going to stuff every pocket you got and hold on to it? Or are you going to trust me enough to know that, that when you release, that makes room for more? He calls into questions our resourcefulness. Now, I can hear you say this. Okay, pastor. He hasn't really given me that much to work with. And here's the truth. The quantity is not really that important to God. Look at verse 10. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. It's a heart a generosity is the issue here. It's the heart of obedience that's important here. Not the amount that you've been given to, ma to manage, but your willingness to release whatever it is he's given you to manage. How many times do you allow yourself to fall into this trap and say, when things get better, then I'll begin to give? How's that working out for you? He doesn't want you to give when things get better. He wants you to give out of what he's giving you right now. 
That's where the trustworthiness comes in. Particularly if you got a lot, you say it'd be easier to give if I, got, if I have a lot. No, it's not. And you start thinking that's you start thinking, well, that's too much to give. And when you have a little, well, I don't, yeah, I don't, I gotta live and I can't make it. God said, don't forget, I am the one who supplied seed to the sower. I am the one who makes the, do I have to pull out my box again? I am the one who supplies your every need, but I need you to empty out the box so that I can put something else in it. I just believe it to be true. If you can't be trusted to tie to God with a little, certainly he won't trust you with a lot. Verse 11, so if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with riches? Threefold understanding here, we're almost there. What does it mean to experience the favor of God. For too long, we thought that it was worldly wealth. When you turn on your television, you turn on your television and they say, glory to God. I don't know why, it has to be God. (laughs) I want to speak to you from God. And God has said, lay your hand and, no, no, lay your hand, but put your ATM card on there. I am glory to God. We're about to do something big right now. And we think that all God got for us is financial blessings. Come on, I'm going to show you something. There are blessings of relationship that are involved in that box. She said, my grandmama gave. Come on, somebody. I, do, you know how, do you know what I would give to sit at my grandmama's table and eat breakfast with her again? Anybody know what I'm talking about? This woman cooked pork chops. Oh, my goodness. I know she entered out of salt shake because she had to. <laughs> then there are blessings. I'm, I'm sorry. How much entertainment is too much entertainment in your culture? Oh, I wish I had a witness. Does anybody remember rabbit ears? Yeah. Now you pay folks to watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> but we have the 2000 channel package. Who watches 2000 dog on channels of TV? Huh, no, all God's supposed to give me is money, money, money. Do you know something? I would, I would trade some money for better relationships sometime. I don't care. I'm, 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 I'm almost there. And, and how much has he given you that you don't even need? Oh, I'm talking to somebody. All the sweet things. I, oh, my goodness. I think about my wife when I do this. All the sweet things. Wasn't that good? Come on. That was good. Yeah, that was good. Trying to work some points in for the future. Do you, get where I'm, do you get where I'm saying to you here? Quite simply, when you think, watch this, that all God has is to give you more stuff. You know what God's end game is for this box? Not so that you can have more stuff, but that you could have more, that he could have more of you. That's all he ever really wants is more of you. Material things are not the end all. Can, material things are nothing more than a quiz, a test, an exam. My pastor told me this. I want to close. My pastor told me this. He said, don't forget it, Boone. Every assignment that I give you as your pastor is an audition. I never forgot that. I said, what do you mean? He says, God's got bigger things for you, but you got to first pass the audition. And so the smallest assignment that God drops in your life, if you drop the ball on it, God said, well, okay, I was ready to do more for them, but I can't trust them. Oh, I wish you got this with the little things. Whenever God asked a question of you, are you ready to release to me, and you find a real million reasons not to, that was an audition. That was a test. That was a quiz. When you love, I'm going to end this, when you love and trust God more than you love and trust money, then you'll experience the fullness of God's favor. Conclusion. God has a Sharpie in his hand, and he's going to reach down from heaven. And you and I have the tag on our shoulder, on our, on our breast. That you know the tag, the name tag, who you are. And, and so God, this is my, my, my thinking, God's got a Sharpie in his hand. And when he reaches down from heaven to write based on this message today, he's going to write two things on the front of your tag. He's going to write... Either one, this is my child who is closed fisted, or this is my child who is free. I want God to look at me. I wish you got this. 
and understood. He says, that is my child and he's free. Oh, come on, someone. Free to trust me. Free to obey me. Free to test me. I wish to God, goodness, that you and I would, would give God a chance to open up your hand and stop being so scared and closed-fisted and judgmental and trying to think through everything and let God be free with God and empty, oh my gosh, I wish, and just empty him out and just toss it up into the sky. Praise belongs here somewhere and just keep tossing. And when he fills it up, you keep tossing and he gives you more and you keep tossing and you look for another field and you just keep tossing. Because every seed that hits the ground, God returns it back to us. But we get so closed in our spirit that we think that all we have in this box is all we'll ever have in this box. It is our prayer that today's word encourage your heart, enrich your mind, and refresh your spirit. If Pastor Boone was a blessing to you today, please consider giving an online donation so that Crossroads can continue providing real-life answers for real-life change.